but still finding ourselves unable to get off the emotional merry-go-round. How to translate a right mental conviction into a right emotional result and so into happy and good living? Well, that's not only the neurotics problem, it's the problem of life itself for all of us who have gotten to the point of real willingness to hew to right principles in all our affairs. Even then, as we hew away, peace and joy may still elude us. That's the place so many of us AA oldsters have come to, and it's a hell of a spot. Literally. How shall our unconscious, from which so many of our fears, compulsions, and phony aspirations still stream, be brought into line with what we actually believe, know, and want? How to convince our dumb, raging, and hitting Mr. hidden Mr. Hyde becomes our main task. I've recently come to believe that this can be achieved. I believe so because I begin to see many benighted ones, folks like you and me, commencing to get results. Last autumn, depression, having no rational cause at all, almost took me to the cleaners. I began to be scared that I was in for another long, chronic spell. Considering the grief I've had with depression, it wasn't a bright prospect. I kept asking myself, why can't the 12 steps work to release my depression? By the hour, I stared at the St. Francis prayer. It is better to comfort than to be comforted. Here was the formula, all right, but why didn't it work? Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to, to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I fought for them, and when defeat came, so did my depression. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal, almost absolute dependencies were cut away. Because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, uh, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, and upon, uh, and indeed upon any set of circumstances whatsoever. Then only could I be free to love as Francis had. Emotional instinctual satisfactions I saw were really extra dividends of having love, offering love, and expressing love, a love appropriate to each relation to life. Plainly, I could not avail myself to God's love until I was able to offer it back to him by loving others as he would have me. And I couldn't possibly do that so long as I was victimized by false dependencies. For my dependency meant demand, a demand for the possession and control of people and the conditions surrounding me. While those words absolute dependency may look like a gimmick, they were the ones that helped to trigger my release into my present degree of stability and quietness of mind. Qualities which I'm now trying to consolidate by offering love to others regardless of their return to me. This seems to be the primary healing circuit an outgoing love of God's creation and his people by means of which we avail ourselves of his love for us. It is most clear that the real current can't flow until our paralyzing dependencies are broken and broken to death. Only then can we possibly have a glimmer of what adult love really is. Spiritual calculus, you say? Not a bit of it. Watch any AA of six months working with a new 12-step case. If the case says to the devil with you, the 12-stepper only smiles and turns to another case. He doesn't feel frustrated or rejected. If his next case responds and in turn starts to give love and attention to other alcoholics, yet gives none back to him, the sponsor is happy about it anyway. He still doesn't feel rejected. Instead, he rejoices that his one-time prospect is sober and happy. And if his next following case turns out in later time to be his best friend or romance, then the sponsor is most joyful. But he well knows that his happiness is a byproduct and the extra dividend of giving without any demand for return. Um, the really stabilizing thing for him was having and offering love to that strange drug on his doorstep. That was Francis at work, powerful and practical, uh, uh, minus dependency and minus demand. In the first six months, of, uh, six months of my own sobriety, I worked hard with many alcoholics. Not one responded. Yet this work kept me sober. It wasn't a question of those alcoholics giving me anything. My stability came out of trying to give and not out of demanding that I receive. Thus, I think it can work out with emotional sobriety. If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependency and its consequent unhealthy demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender these hobbling demands. Then we can be set, and free, to live, set free to live in love. We may then be able to 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. Of course, I haven't offered you a really new idea. 
only a gimmick that has started to unhook several of my own hexes at death. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsively in either elation, grandiosity, or depression. I have been given a quiet place in the bright sunshine. All right. Uh, thank everybody for coming to the meeting tonight. Um, it is my privilege, and I don't want to take up too much of our time, uh, to um, introduce Kate, who is a phenomenal member of AA and um, is somebody I really admire and look up to and always enjoy everything she has to share. So without further ado, and I hope you will tell the observed story on like the subatomic particles thing. We'll explain that later. I know that sounds weird, but maybe you can work that in. You know, that's one of my favorites. Um, so tonight we have the very uh, wonderful Kate and I'm gonna open it up to you and take it away, have fun with it. Thanks, Sam. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I was waiting for you guys to say hi, Kate. Uh, when I sit back, if you can't hear me or if you, if you need me to speak up, please feel free to jump in and just say that. Um, thank you, Sam, for asking me to speak tonight. Um, it is definitely an honor and a privilege, and I hate it. So uh, I very much appreciate that. It is a good time in my sobriety to get way outside of my comfort zone. Um, my sobriety date is September 15th of 2008. And uh, I'm really grateful for that sobriety date. I'm really grateful it's not like a week ago. Uh, this has not been a very easy year for me. It has taken a lot of growth. And the person that I was at the beginning, you know, when I hit 11 years sober, 100% would not be sober today. Uh, I have had to grow closer to God. I have had to take a look at emotional sobriety, at my dependencies, um, and not just take a look, but be willing to give some of that up, or I could not, uh, I wouldn't be speaking here tonight. I wouldn't even be sober. So, um, you know, it's amazing how when I first came in, I did not connect. I just had a drinking problem. I didn't connect with you all on selfishness or dishonesty or a need for God, which I thought was a fake thing anyway. I didn't have any of that going on. I just needed my sobriety. And then the other little problems in my life naturally would get better because I would finally acknowledged that drinking was the root problem. And it's amazing that today, you know, pretty darn far away from a drink, um, the issues that I face at times seem even bigger than that. Um, going through this letter, and I printed it out. I hope that's not weird. Did everybody print it out? I mean, okay, I printed it out. I don't know, it seemed like the thing to do. So anyway, um, I will try to talk about some of these dependencies, um, and I'm just gonna sh just, just show up really honestly tonight because I don't know what else to do. I don't wanna be one of those people um, who you know dies with years of sobriety because my AA ego and this image that I wanna preserve takes me out. So um, I don't know how, any, how to be anything but honest. And as long as I see it, I'm usually pretty willing, willing to share it. Uh, it's usually a question of, of if I see it or not. So. I'm just gonna talk about some of this as openly and honestly as I can. Um, where Bill talks about these adolescent urges, I mean, this was like a smack in the face, a dose of humility. These adolescent urges, I'm just calling them adolescent, right? For top approval, perfect security, and perfect romance. Like, isn't that the story of my life? Those are the things that I have so heavily pursued. And so you would think that since I've turned so much of my attention to that and put my dependence and my work on that, that I would have like, a perfect relationship and like all this financial security and yet like I'm divorced and and I'm getting ready to start a new job that prior to this I hardly made anything like even my best efforts at pursuing the things that I think I need to be okay and to keep myself safe my best efforts of that have even failed so um it's crazy the amount of time that I can put into things that simply do not work um, and the adolescent urges. So I just spent a week, I was on vacation um, with my boyfriend and his adolescent son. And so I just spent eight days with them. We went out to Colorado, even though the conference was canceled and, and Utah and whatnot. And um, 
So adolescent urges is like real clear in my mind. And I haven't um, spent a lot of time with a 16 year old boy until last week, uh, probably since I was like a 14 year old girl. And so I kind of forgot what they're like. And um, my judgment around like that adolescent phase was pretty harsh sometimes. You know, it definitely took some love and some tolerance and some going to prayer um, just to keep my mouth shut and, and kind of enjoy the week or whatever. So it's insulting to me because my mental, you know, storytelling and judgment and criticism was harsh at times because we see like how adolescent I am, you know, um, and that, that how crazy is it when I am at the, the mercy, when I am dominated by the behaviors of, of an adolescent, of a child, you know, I don't even mean me. I mean like this person. And that's what I do when I continuously um, put my dependence in other people and how they're acting and what they think of me or what I think they think of me, which is usually even worse. Um, I put myself at the mercy of them. I am dominated by people who are either sick or just simply acting their age, right? Who are just like being people. The world is not going to behave the way that I want. And yet I try um, again and again and again to pursue that, you know, to get everything to fit into this little box so that I can be okay. And, uh, and it's exhausting. I had a sponsee say to me recently, um, being frustrated all the time is exhausting. <laughs> and that has like been the story of my life for a chunk of this year. Um, it has been, whew, it has been rough. But anyway, the adolescent thing was the first part that stuck out because of that. So top approval, perfect security and perfect romance. Um, you know, the main areas where I have placed my dependence um, relationships, appearance, um, which kind of ties in with like what other people think of me and, um, and how I kind of stack up against other women, which isn't real, but in my head it is, you know, and in reality, like there's no competition for me. Um, I am a perfect child of God and I have a perfect role to fulfill and there is no competition for that. Um, but I, I get lost in thinking that there is, and then, and then it starts to, to draw me away from other people. But um, anyway, the, so this need to like put my dependence on relationships in early sobriety, um, everybody told me not to get into a relationship, that it wasn't a good idea. And I judged the, the other new women who I saw doing that. And whatever you judge, you will become just wait uh, if it hasn't happened yet. And, and so here I was in this relationship in early sobriety and then I got engaged and then I hadn't even finished a four step and then I got married and um, I put all of my worth and my value into this, you know? And unfortunately, because I was a sick pup, you know, I had married a sick pup. And so um, because who I thought I was, you know, not tying myself to God, but tying myself to this man who was simply doing the best that he could. And sometimes the best we can do um, is like a shit show. So I had tied myself to that. And so when it all fell apart and um, he was unable to be faithful and he was unable to work and a lot of these sort of negative things were going on within the marriage, my self-esteem was like at this all time low. And I'm not somebody who's ever had this excellent, you know, self-worth, but was at this all time low because that was who I was, you know, like I was a wife. That was a role that I took on. And not that there isn't a lot of honor in that role. And, and I would love to, you know, one day in the future be a wife again, but I took that as my main thing. Not that I'm a child of God, not that I'm here to play the role that God assigns me, but I'm here to be this person's wife. And so when I couldn't be that anymore because of the things that were happening within the marriage, um, it was just crushing, you know? And I didn't realize it was like, he was this perfect person to pull all of this sickness out of me that I didn't know existed. Um, because essentially, you know, I had married a sex addict and then wondered why he couldn't be faithful, you know? And, and at the end of that, as I kind of stepped back and it's like, oh, okay, well, hmm, let me think, this isn't the first time, you know, that I've ended up in a situation like this. So what is it about me that attracts sex addicts, right? But I'm asking the wrong question because the question is, what is it about me that's attracted to that? 
And that was where it's like, God is so much bigger than any dumb, crazy plan that I come up with. Because even the disaster of that marriage, God was able to use that as a tool to be like, let's pull this out and put it in your face and look at it. You know, let's do something different here. My worth and value was so tied up with sex and with what men thought of me um, that I drew that, those sort of people to me. Um, so there are a lot of lessons to be, to be learned in that, but, but it's not like this habit that I fully broken, you know, I'm in a relationship now and absolutely my self-worth gets tied up in this person. And it is a really unhealthy place to be. Um, when I decide that my dependence and how okay I'm going to be and my happiness and all of that, uh, should be tied to what someone else thinks of me or, or my perception of what they think of me, my perception of how I'm treated, which is way worse than the reality of it, you know, because I tell myself a story and it gets worse every time I tell it. Um, but I still continue to, to struggle with that. And so I, like I shared, I've hit this place in this year, um, you know, what some, some of you would call like a winter of sobriety. And I thought that was just like, a few months of the year, like I kind of hit this really low point and then I came out of it and I thought I was all good again. And I was talking to my sponsor recently and she said, well, yeah, this is your winter year. And I said, the whole damn year? I didn't know it was going to be the whole year. I mean, my God, I thought I'd be beyond, beyond this by now. I thought that was like, you know, six months ago or something. But um, because I have that habit of, of, of tying myself to him and, and we have struggled recently. I'm an inventory. I think he's an inventory. I'm not sure. But um, the relationship has been a struggle. And so I have not been able to find my safety and my security in that. And, uh, and thank God. And, and a week ago, I wouldn't have said that. But today, thank God. Um, because then I'm forced to just rely on God. Then I'm forced to have my dependence in the right place. And it has been like this huge, you know, paradigm shift just over this past week. Um, as a result of that, of finally seeing like, wait a minute, you know, let me back up here. Um, this is not working. Like me forcing it to be a certain way and, and me trying to control somebody else and me, um, you know, just being reactionary to everything. It's not working. So I went, um, I, uh, so the, Aqu the full Aquarius moon was this week, a few days ago. And um, I have been doing some reading, I'm an Aquarius, and I've been doing some reading about it. And I just knew that um, my job and, and relationship and this other stuff over here, like some of these things are not serving me well. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go sit out underneath this full Aquarius moon and God's going to like, you know, bestow upon me this amazing answer. And like, there'll be a burning bush probably. And It'll be very magical. And so I did that. I had a date with the moon and I'm sitting outside and I'm just quiet and it, um, I'm just quiet and I'm just letting the energy of God flow through me. And I'm just trying to be in the world of the spirit. And as I kind of contemplate, like not from my head, but from my heart, as I kind of contemplate, like, what is it that I need to shed here? Um, cause I'm an inventory, so I'm shedding ideas, you know, all these, what is it? And, and the answer that very clearly came to me is, is that I need to shed the attachment. I think that the problem is the job or the relationship. He's not acting right. Or, oh, it's these old beliefs. It's the attachment. It's not the beliefs or the him or the job or the, any of it. It's my attachment to those things that has to be shed. And it was like, boom you know, and, and, and the God will meet you wherever you are. The beautiful thing about that, like, you don't have to sit underneath the, the Aquarius full moon for that to happen. You know, that's just like, God knows to find me there. Like there's that little weirdo sitting out there with her dog looking at the moon. So, um, but, but God will find you wherever you are in that. Um, but just to bring that open, willing heart, not because I just desire to be open and willing, but because what I've been trying to do up to this point is so not working to bring that to God and then to be like, okay, let go of the attachment to it. And the rest will all become clear. And so now I don't have to worry about it. Now I don't have to obsessively figure out what's going to happen with this, 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 what's it going to look like in a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. When I die, I'm going to die alone. You know, I don't have to worry about any of that. If I can just simply shed the attachment to it and just have my attachment be with God. Um, 
So I think that was kind of my relationship piece. Um, I, had, I feel silly saying that I put my dependence and my security um, onto money uh, because I've worked in public education for the last five years. And so, you know, that's probably not where you work if you want to make a lot of money. Um, but the truth is like, that is still very much been present for me. Um, and I think for a long time, I tried to deny it. I had these ideas that like, it was wrong to want to pursue something different. And again, more ideas that had to be shed. Like I just got a new job that I start on Monday. And a lot of that has had to do with like letting go of my attachment to some of this, um, that it is okay to depend on money. It's not okay to depend on, it's like, if I just depend on God and don't focus on the rest of it, it will all fall into place. I, I don't think I'm being very clear. What I'm trying to say is, so the f first and foremost, um, I had to make my financial amends. That has been a, a big part of my recovery. And it's something that I ignored for several years into recovery. I was probably, I don't know, five or six years sober before I really looked at financial amends in any sort of substantial way, like paying back the money that I owed, the back taxes, the places that I stole from, um, all of that stuff. I didn't tackle any of it. And, and my finances were like this disaster. Um, I couldn't open my mail. I couldn't answer my phone. It was just like huge unmanageability in that area of my life. Um, I think it, you know, three, four years sober, I'm going to Vieques on drug money. I mean, it's just like a, a mess, an absolute mess. And so um, one day I very clearly saw that in order to continue staying sober, that had to immediately change. Um, the book says that if we don't lose our fear of facing our creditors, we're liable to drink. And that line hit me like it was like it had never been there before. And I just saw it one day and I started answering my phone and I started opening the mail and I started paying back this money and going to the stores that I stole from and getting all that stuff cleared up. And, and as a result of that, you know, my finances changed drastically. I went from living paycheck to paycheck, being totally irresponsible to like having savings, uh, buying a home, being able to go back to school because I could get um, loans. You can't get federal student loans when you have not paid your federal taxes for four years. They don't just give you more money when they are already waiting on theirs. So things that had been impossible for me up to that point suddenly started to open up as a result of our process, right? So through, through the immense process. But even on the other side of that, um, I didn't know that this idea had started to lurk around in my head. It just looked like, um, why does she get that? You know, why does he have that car? Like, how come that job came so easy to him? Um, you know, this, the, the, he's got three felonies. I've got three degrees. Like, what's wrong with me? You know what I mean? Why are these people doing so much better than me? And so rather than if God were involved in that, it wouldn't have been this competition thing and this jealousy, but it was, and I couldn't see it. And so I've really been struggling with that over probably the past year. Um, and it has distanced me. It separated me more and more and more from people that I love, you know, people that I, that I dearly care about and, and just the general public, people that I don't even know. I mean, I can get resentful at someone that I don't even know simply because they have something that I don't. And I didn't used to be that way. So it just took me by surprise. It was sneaky. I didn't see it coming. It was sneaky. It just slithered in. And um, I've got to this really angry and hateful place around it. And like I said, I'm in inventory right now. So I've done quite a lot of writing around some of these principles that I have. And uh, and so what it looks like to bring God into to recognize like, okay, this is the issue and, and my dependence isn't in the right place to bring God into that is that, um, that I started to have to change or allow my ideas around money to be changed and to see that, that it's not a struggle, you know, um, that things flow in and through, right? And, and if I'm not giving it away freely, it's not coming in freely and I'm not going to get too far into like, you know, um, manifestations and whatnot, but, but as a result of some of the reading that I've done this year, I know this is an AA, so I feel pretty free to talk about some of this kind of stuff. Some of the readings that I've done this year, um, some of Joe Dispenza, Joe Dispenza's work, some of Marianne Williamson's work, um, bringing God into my financial life in a new way and just simply being open to receiving, it has drastically changed, uh, 
things that seemed way out of reach suddenly become like easily possible. And, and what I started to see, because I thought that um, people make money because they're worthy of it, you know? And so if I don't have money, it's because I'm not worthy. And so I would look at and say like, what makes them better than me? Like, why are they in God's favor and I'm not? What makes them so special? What do they have that I don't have? And I'm missing the whole mark, you know, that like, whatever God has for me is enough and whatever God has for them is enough. Um, and so anyway, and so I just doing a new kind of prayer work around that and involving some of this outside literature, um, my belief system started to change and, and I recognized that I want a new job. I felt led into a new career that's kind of been going on, but more recently here, I have felt led into a new career and that it wasn't going to be this struggle, right? The dependence on God means like, if God has this for me, it, I, it's not going to be this arduous task. It's going to be this like really difficult thing. That doesn't mean I don't have to get out there and go look for a job and, and you know, submit resumes and, and do the whole deal. Yes, of course, I have done that. But it's not going to be this thing that is like, um, you know, this just like terribly insurmountable task. That's not the way that God's will has worked for me. And so... I wanted to quit my job uh, back in December. I wanted to not go back after winter break. I was in a really low place with it. And um, it just did not fit me. It does not fit me well anymore. It has not served me well. And my attitude sucked. That's the truth. Like I had a piss poor attitude around work and I really wanted to not go back. And I thought like, yep, like God's just going to give me this job, you know, let's bring it on and I won't go back and it'll be great. And then I had to go back and I was like, oh, you know, disappointed. And back to that negative thinking of like, oh, how come God favors other people? But, but God just has like different timing. You know what I mean? Dependence on God means that like, I know that the universe wants what's best for me and will orchestrate that and doesn't need my help in organizing it, right? Like the, the universe knows how to like do whatever it's supposed to do. It just may not happen in my immediate time frame. Um, but I couldn't see that with then. So I went back after winter break and I'm resentful and unhappy about it. And then what happened is that Corona hit. And so the second half of the year, I was barely even working. And what I didn't recognize is that by staying at my job, I had hit like my five year match for my pension. And so now that I'm leaving my job, I get to keep that match. And I didn't know I was told it was a 10 years, but it's actually at five years. So those are the sort of things that like, if it's in God's timing, it just works out better. And I'm not saying that it always works out that way, but um, but my forced time frame, like my need to get another job now so that I can be okay, would have screwed the whole thing up. And so then this summer, I continued to, to look for a new job. And there was this job that I really, really wanted. And I felt like, this is it, you know, God wants this for me too. It's going to be great. And then I didn't get it. And so we, we went on vacation. And when I came back Sunday night, I'm crying, right? Like, leave it to me. I have this great vacation. I'm coming home to my dog. I should be excited, but I'm crying because I didn't get this job. And I had just had these hopes that I would be coming home to start a new job. So Monday morning, I have this like mandatory work meeting for my old job. And um, it sounds like the way the school year is going to go is like even worse than what I had anticipated. But what happened in between there, like, coming home and, and realizing, okay, this is it, is that I let go. And my sponsor would say to me um, things like, there's always enough money and there's never enough money. And she would like, and I know that that's true, I guess, I get it. And, and I get when people say like, oh, money's not gonna make you happy and you can't do it. I get it, but I promise you until Sunday, I was 100% convinced and would have been honest about it that like, getting a new job and making more money is the ticket. That's what's going to fix what's wrong with me, you know? 100% convinced. No matter what you said, even though what you said was maybe also true, I knew that I was right about that. And so when I realized that I was, I was coming back and I wasn't going to get that job, I, I just let it go. And I said, okay, God, I guess it's you and I, you know? I guess I'm not going to be able to like use this thing to fix my life and make me feel better and make me feel worthy and like give me something to be excited about. It's just you and I. So what do you want me to do? Like what's next? And, uh, and then I told you about the, the Aquarius moon thing and just letting go of the attachment. And so Monday morning I go to this work meeting. It doesn't go well. 
And I get off of that meeting and maybe an hour and a half later, that job that I really wanted called and they offered me a position and I accepted it. And I'm so stoked about it, but it's like, thank God that that didn't come a day sooner. Not just because like, since I went to a work meeting in August, I now have health insurance all of August, which I didn't know, but not even just because like, it gave me the time to see that like, this isn't going to fix me. So yeah, I'm super thrilled and I can't wait to get started. And I think it's a great fit and I'm excited to make more money and all of that stuff. But, um, it's still not the answer. Like I need God just as much now, probably more than I did before getting that job, but I couldn't have seen it any sooner than that. Um, I love God's timing. I mean, sort of, because it's never like a little bit early. It's never like, I like to plan things out in advance and, um, God does not work that way. It's not like, oh, I know you were getting a little bit nervous about it. So here, I want you to know, like, this is how it's going to be. It's like right on time, just a, right on time, not a split second early. Um, so the way that that all kind of shook out, it just, it, it, it builds my dependence. And I'm not here to say like, oh, I have this perfect dependence on God, right? Like recently I found out that my brother had cancer and, um, while you know god being everything would look like okay god like whatever your will is right those were not my prayers that's not what i was begging for i was begging and praying for an extremely specific outcome in that regard right and as of right now that has been the outcome which is amazing and, and wonderful and and that we're so grateful for that but i don't want to give this idea that like oh i have this great dependence i don't i i still struggle but some of these things that have been big for me over this year the obsession with the relationship the obsession with finding a new job some of that has started to be like untangled um and thank god Whew. uh another thing that bill talked about in that letter was his depression and i wanted to make sure to talk about that because um I don't know, probably other people in my life might tell you differently, but I would not describe myself as someone who's really like struggled with depression a whole lot, not in sobriety anyway. Um, but I guess the truth is, so like right around three, four years sober, I hit this like suicidal depression. And um, if you looked at my life at the time with everything that was going on with my marriage and whatnot, you could say like, oh yeah, that makes sense that you would be super depressed. And um, then when I was about seven, eight years sober, right before I got my current sponsor, um, I hit this depression. And you could look at my life there and say like, oh yeah, boy, that looks really stressful and you know, a lot going on. It makes sense that you would be depressed. And then this past year, you know, 11 years sober, I hit this like rock bottom depression. Um, and it was terrifying because you couldn't look at my life and say like, you have a reason to be depressed. And so that line in the book where, um, where it talks about our tr so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. I remember my first sponsor saying like, oh, it's such a you know, hopeful promise because now I don't need you to change for me to be okay. If my troubles are of my making, great. I'm the only one that needs to change. And that was comforting until this past year when it was like, oh my God, I, I might have a better shot at changing you than I do uh, of changing me. Uh, and it's terrifying to be like, I can't blame alcohol. I can't blame the him. I can't blame the anything. Like something is wrong with me at a deep level that I can't seem to fix. Um, so I was just in this really, really dark place and it felt like nothing was working. And I do the things, right, that we're supposed to do. I sponsor a bunch of women. I do my night review. I do the things. Um, but it, I couldn't get on the other side of this. And I would talk to my sponsor, and she would say, like, basically, just keep doing the things anyway. I'm sure she said it more eloquently than that. But just keep doing the things anyway. Like, God is there whether you feel it or not. You know, and I have to keep taking these steps to, to stay sober. At the end of the day, if I stay sober, I have a chance. You know, if I don't make it, if suicide looks like an option or, or if the drink comes for me, um, I don't have a shot, you know, but if I stay sober, then I do. So I got to keep doing the things. And so I did, even though I felt like there was really no path forward and I wasn't getting any relief from it. And then, you know, kind of how it came out of nowhere, it didn't come out of nowhere, 
I like self-pity. I like to sit there and feel sorry for myself. It's like comforting to me, ooh, self-pity. And I played around with self-pity so long that I couldn't stop thinking that way. That's part of the truth. So let me be honest about that. I didn't just get hit with depression. I was indulging and feeling sorry for me and playing the victim for so long that then I couldn't stop doing it even when I saw that it wasn't true. So uh, now when I catch that thinking, I take it to God instead of like, building a story around it for eight weeks or whatever. So, um, but anyway, suddenly I kind of came out of it, right? And, and I was in the light again and I could feel the power and the presence of God and everything was okay and nothing had changed. Nothing in my circumstances had changed, but suddenly I'm okay again. And then, like I said in the beginning, I thought that would be like the rest of this year of sobriety, but it, it has kind of come back. Um, it has kind of come back, but to look at my depression, to label it as a defect, and I'm not saying anybody who's struggling with depression that that's a defect, because I have no idea what you're dealing with, but I'm saying my depression is a defect. It is not this real thing. It is a, it is defective thinking. It is a lack of gratitude. It is being full of self-pity. It's a lack of faith. Um, it is being unwilling to just submit to what God has for me. It is a defect. So being able to label it that, and look at it from that perspective um, is helpful because that's what we do in AA, right? I write some inventory, I've got the defects, I take them in a six and seven where I owe amends, I make amends, I change, right? I stay current in 10, 11, and 12. Like I have a process for that. Whereas when it, I was just lost in this place of like, oh, another depression, like here I am totally powerless. Like, yeah, kind of, but not really because I still have to do the things that we have to do in order to, um, to to get on the other side of it. And, and so I'm not perfectly there, but when I look at where I was at at the beginning of this year, where my life, everything was so great that it's like, why even rely on God? You know what I mean? Like my dependence on other people at the beginning of this year was working because I had loved my job. Relationship was like, ease couldn't be easier. You know what I mean? No struggles at all. I've got this great house so I could like, rely on all these other things and it worked um and i'm just so grateful that it doesn't work anymore because i i want more i want more god like at a deeper level and unfortunately i just won't seek that like when i can get it cheap and easy i want it cheap and easy when i can get it at the shopping mall or um and a man or in money or a new car, when I, when I, I'll just pursue that. I don't mean to, you know, it's just my natural state to like, what's the simplest way to feel better here? You know, what, what's the, the instant gratification? Like, how do I get myself to what I think will make me happy? That's what I tend to pursue. So, um, so thank you God for like removing that stuff, removing like the payoff from those things so that I could just seek God instead. Um, another place I, that I think I have put a lot of dependence is on like, um, appearance and, uh, man that works until it doesn't. <laughs> and if you're, um, you know, a woman in your twenties, live it up, but eventually, um, it doesn't work anymore. And, and that has been a very, I'm embarrassed to say, but like I said, I'm just going to be totally honest. Uh, I have struggled with vanity and that has been a huge, huge challenge for me. Um, and early sobriety, uh, I, every meeting that I went to, everywhere I went to, I had like high heels on. I mean, just like everything. Every, and I still have this wonderful shoe collection. Um, but like, you're probably not going to see me at a meeting like that today. You know, maybe like if you do, I must have gone out to dinner with Brad or something beforehand. Um, and not that there's, please wear whatever shoes you want, okay? It's your body, you dress it however you please, but there's not as much of a need for me to try to seek approval from you all in that way. Like I wanted to be, once want to be like pretty Kate. You know, I want my girlfriends to think I'm pretty. I want the guys to think I'm pretty. I want everybody to think I'm pretty. I build my work on that. You know, I am dependent on what you think of me in that way. And so you got to have the clothes and the outfit and all of that to go with it. Um, and I, as I have let go of some of that, not perfectly, and I promise you not in any way gracefully, like not even an ounce, but just because I simply have to, 
um, because it doesn't work anymore as in it doesn't fulfill me. And also I'm a lot older now and it's just not the same, you know what I mean? It's just not the same. Some of that stuff's just like, you know, that's for, <laughs> that's a young girl's game. Um, that has been like another, uh, I don't know, just huge sort of theme of this past year for me is trying to get on the other side of that and, and to to know that like what God has for me and how God finds me most useful doesn't really have anything to do with like how high my heels are um, or how high anything is. <laughs> it, it's not about that, you know, and that like at the end of the day, there was a time where um, being kind of obsessive about that, I think did sometimes draw women to me, you know, and I could sponsor them or be friends with them or whatever. And now it's like um, being a woman of God and being a woman of principle is what draws people to me. Uh, and that's been big. I mean, it's been embarrassingly <laughs> a big deal for me. My sponsors heard about this like time and time again. And don't worry, it made this most recent inventory. So um, you can hear about it once more if you're on here, Erica. Um, but it just has to go. It's just one of the many things that, that has to be shed. My need, I have been shocked, like honestly shocked at how important it is to me what you all think of me and how much I need your approval. Because I thought that that was like early sobriety problem. You know, you write that stuff on your first inventory, like I'm not important. I'm not enough. I'm unattractive, you know, nobody likes me. Then, then like after that, it's pretty much gone. Cause I feel like that's sort of what happened. You know, that I had this whole span where I didn't know how attached to that I was. I didn't know that my dependence was on that. I would have told you like, of course my dependence is on God, you know, but it's become painfully apparent that like, wow, I did not anticipate that at this stage of sobriety, I would be dealing with that. It has crippled me this year. Um, I mean, I have had to like back away from friendships at times because I am so um, painfully jealous of what other people have going on, like that intense need to compete with other women or just because like my head starts to go like, she's out to get me. What did she mean by that comment? And I don't mean like some mean girl or some girl in the rooms who's known to gossip. I mean like close friends who love me to death, like my girls and when it's just this one or it's just that one then I'm like okay maybe but what starts to happen is that everybody starts to be against me and that's like the clue ding 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 like that's not real none of this is real nobody is out to get you they're not taking pleasure and like you being hurt over this circumstance or you not getting that thing that you wanted um I have made myself just, it's like I said, it's been a rough year. I've made myself crazy with that this year. I'm pretty sure that I owe some amends as a result of it. Actually, I already know that I do because I wrote for a column on them. Um, I produce confusion because of my intense need to have your approval. And then when I decide that I'm not getting it, it has nothing to do with whether I am or I'm not. And it doesn't matter anyway. But when I decide that I'm not like, um, you know, looked at favorably by you, I start to back away. I start to not pick up the phone. And then people are left wondering, like, what happened? You know, like, we were so close. Um, we talked all the time. You know, we have this really open hearted, intimate, trusting, loving relationship. And I just kind of back, 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 back. And then maybe I'll pop back up, you know, if I'm in like a good place. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess everything's fine. And it was all in their head. Like, that's the sort of stuff that I create. Um, through this intense need to, for you to like me and to think that I'm awesome and, and not just like me and think that I'm awesome, but to be better than everybody else. I think Bill talks about that in the letter too. Yeah, um, top approval. Like I've gotta be the top dog. You know, I've gotta be the prettiest or I'm nothing. I've gotta have the best job or I'm not shit. You know, I've got the best, the best, the best. And then like, I, what, what about when somebody else wants to be the best? You know, what about when it's like that girl's turn to have her special moment and like all the attention on some big accomplishment that she just had? You know, I don't share that well. And that's ugly. God, that's ugly. And that is not who I want to be. And I know 100, 1000%, like 
that is not the woman who God calls me to be. Um, so I've got to grow from where I stand right now. Like where else, where else can I grow from? I wish I could tell you that, um, I don't know that I'm just like this beam of spiritual goodness. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm just me and I'm just human and, and I'm, and I'm a perfect child of God, but I think only perfect in God's eyes. I'm, I'm not sure that that means it in like any other regard. So the person that I am, like, this is who I have to take to God. And as embarrassing as it can be for me, like when I go to God now and acknowledge my doubt, it's almost like, it's embarrassing. I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. Like, I can't believe that I doubted you at all. I can't believe that I thought that this other thing was going to take better care of me than you were. How insane is that? Like all the evidence of my life, of my sobriety, all of it points to God is always the answer, you know, and yet I keep trying these other things. So when I recognize it now and I go to God with it, um, I mean, maybe it's humility. I don't know. Let's call it humility because that sounds better than embarrassment humility of being like, oh God, I'm so sorry that, that I practiced doubt instead of faith, you know? Um, but my favorite thing about God is that like, I don't get punished for that. You know, it's just used as like a, a, a learning tool, right? God disciplines us. Um, like the book talks about the simple way that's outlined, God disciplines us. So it's used as a tool for discipline and for correction and for growth rather than God being like, yeah, you doubted me one too many times. So like, we're done now. Or I was going to give you this great thing, but you didn't have faith in me. You relied on him instead. So now you don't get it. God has never pulled that with me, you know? So I think that's all the more reason that it probably is crazy to put my dependence anywhere else. Um, I'm just looking at this letter to see if there's anything else that I really wanted to, to talk about. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll share, um, this love without demand, you know, I got to be honest, I, you got the wrong speaker for that. Uh, I have my friend Jason said, oh, I hope I get to hear your emotional sober talk. And I said, I hope I can be emotionally sober. I mean, my God, um, one day, like, that's the goal, right? Love without demand, that's the goal. And I'm starting to learn how you would think like I would start practicing it with, I don't know, my mom or my boyfriend or my best friend. But I'm actually trying to practice it like at the grocery store and when I'm waiting in line and at the gas station because I can't seem to pull it off anywhere else. Um, love without demand. It just feels like a tall order. Like, I hope so. You know, um, if you know how to get there, please tell me. But uh, the, the one thing that I did want to share some experience on is um, this idea of like the current can't flow until our paralyzing dependencies are broken. And I didn't see that for a long time. Um, I didn't see that like the current was blocked in me for a lot, a lot, a lot of reasons. But since this isn't an actual AA meeting, I'm just gonna share this experience. So I was in meditation um, and it was a, a meditation. Um, Brad had brought it home from like a conference or something. We had done this meditation together and he gave me a copy of it. And I was then later doing the same meditation by myself. And, it wasn't like, I mean, yeah, it was a great meditation, but it wasn't anything different necessarily than what I do in meditation any other day. So, you know, it's not like I manifested this, um, but I do hope that like the work that I've done in the program, you know, perhaps prepared me for it. So I'm in this meditation and I start to realize that I feel this huge shield and it's like wrapped around like up in my ribs and here all across my chest, this huge shield. And if you would have asked like, people really close to me or even like a therapist, they would tell you that, right? Like there is stuff is blocked and energy has to flow in and through and mine can't because it just gets stuck, you know, it just gets stuck in there. And so I'm in this meditation and I recognize there's this shield and I don't need this, you know, whatever this was for, I don't even know if it was of this lifetime, whatever this was for, I don't need it now. It's not serving me well. It may have protected me at some point, but it's no longer working. It's now become this thing that diminishes my life and that makes me unable to relate with people, to be open and loving for God's love to flow in and through me. You know, it can't come out because I have this thing on me. And all of a sudden it just like half of it breaks off. And I realized it was actually two separate shields. It wasn't just this one piece, you know, that it comes from these two different places and 
in my life or, or a previous life or whatever, again, this is an AA, so I'm not going to talk about it. So half of this thing breaks off and, and, and I can feel like the lightness now on this side. And, and now when I go into meditation, because there's still this separate piece over here, like I know there's nothing I can do to just get rid of it, to make God take it. But I just try to be like, to let God know, like, I'm, I'm ready. Whenever you can take this from me, I don't want that protection anymore. Like God is enough protection for me. God is all I need in this life. I don't need this other thing. And, and then I'm willing to let it go. Um, I'm not sure really how that related to any of that, but, but I just wanted to share it. Um, oh, the in and through. Yeah. The whole, the in and through, like, I can't, I can't just, um, access God's love and fill up with God's love and then what like do nothing with it you know then it just like oozes out like, it doesn't work that way and um somebody said something that was super like basic and obvious and simple but it has been profound to me which is like that if, if God is love then love is God and so that's how I put my little piece of God out there into the world is by loving the people that I interact with you know and if I'm not able to do that because it, it can only come in and it can't come out, then it's like, it just seeps back out. You know, it doesn't work that way. And it's not, I mean, you can label it whatever you want, but whatever I withhold will be withheld from me. That is the law of the universe. And it's not like a punishing thing. It's just simply how it works, you know? So whether it's money or love or honesty, whatever it is, I, it has to be able to, you know, come out of me. I have to be able to put that out there in order to receive it. I have to give it in order to receive it. Um, so that's been a really, uh, I don't know, just strange and important change for me um, in my recent sobriety. It's, it's not just, no, my, my sponsor says, it's not profound that I know it. It's profound that I do it. Like if I do something about it, you know, it's not like, woohoo, I learned this thing or I had this, you know, wild experience in meditation where this shield came off of me or whatever. Like, what do I do with that now? Like, what does it look like now? to go to God as this sort of changed person, um, because I have to be this changed person. Like it has to keep going. What does it look like when I bring this, this new self to God? And, and the truth is, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, I'm really grateful to be where I'm at, uh, as in like, I'm really grateful to be sober right now. I'm really grateful to have made it through most of this year. Um, and I mean like sobriety year, uh, sober and I'm really grateful to my prayer even just a few days ago under the moon was like okay God um, you know help me shed this attachment help me shed that attachment and my prayer today when I got up was like just take whatever like shed it all I don't care do whatever God it, you know I'm all yours like the only the only protection and dependence that I that I need is from God so I don't know how long that'll last but it's really good right now and uh, Sam, thank you so much for asking me to share. And I think that's all I have. All right. What a good share. I love it. I can relate to so many things that you said. And it's so funny how, you know, you just uh, with the financial stuff and with all these other things, you know, it's like Chuck C used to say, uh, when I stopped trying to get rich, I got rich. <laughs> I didn't care anymore. You know, like it's when that dependence on all that stuff goes away that things just, it's funny how they operate, you know, like, um, I got, a, I got out of all this debt um, and it was in, it was like, and it could have been a lifetime worth of stuff. Like it could have not a lifetime, but a good 10 years worth of crap to pay off. And like it, it happened in two months and I had been worried about it for forever. And something worked out crazy that all this stuff worked out, this worked out, and, you know, this business blew up that I thought was going to be, a, well, I was a complete failure at and it just, all these things happened that were awesome. And they just, you know, and you never think that stuff's going to happen until you really go all in. You know, it's like when you go all in, that's when like the cool stuff happens. I love that. So um, I'd like to, to open it up. And um, if you'd like to share, let me see how I do this. Participants raise their hands. Um, let me see if I can see raise hands. And um, so Chris, maybe you watch it with me uh, since you're the host, just in case. But I, I think if anybody would like to share it, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll, Go through it for another 30 minutes. Thanks again. That was beautiful. I'm going to get you to tell that story before the end of it.
Tom, you want to share? Nobody's raising their hand. Oh, there we go. You can. Uh, Y-U-C-H-E-N. Hi. You there? Yeah. Hi. My name is Yu Chen. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for your service. I'm really grateful to be here. And Kate, that was amazing. I actually, I don't know why, but that last bit, that meditation part that you talked about, that experience, actually made me start to tear up a little bit. Um, I, I don't know why, but I'm really glad that you shared that. I think it's just, it really touched me just being like, you know, like this stuff doesn't serve me anymore. And I think a lot of us feel like that. Like I've been carrying this for way too long, God. And like, I really don't want it anymore. Um, so right now for that, that for me is like, thank you for talking about like vanity and appearance, right? Like that for me has been a big part. Um, not that other stuff aren't in my life but like this thing it's just like in sobriety over and over and over I just can't let go of it so if anyone knows how to like please help me like how do I stop caring about like my one of my biggest issues body image and like I am in my 20s like you know I'm a young girl in my 20s and like I look fine but like in my head I'm never looking good enough and it's like I constantly tell myself what you told me or you just said right like how God finds me useful isn't about my appearance. Um, isn't, and like to me, it's like, it isn't about how good my body look. And you know, like God's grace is like amazing today. It can be of use to other people. But like in my head, I like look at, you know, whether I stop weighing myself at some point because I realized it didn't help me. But I still in my head, I'm like looking at myself every time I see the reflection and be like, oh, the quarantine is not looking good on me. Like I didn't exercise today. I didn't eat right today. Like I have attachment to these things and I don't know how to let it go. I really would love to let it go so that I can have so much more thought, like brain space thinking about other people. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to like own that part. And then, you know, I like, I also just, I want to end with like saying, talking about like love without demand. Like, thank you for sharing about that part. That's really difficult. I think for all of us as well. Um, I did have one experience recently with it though. Um, I had a sponsee who really, you know, when she came to me, um, she was not only like in alcoholism, she was also like in an abusive relationship. So I really was completely powerless over her. Not, it wasn't just about whether she would go back and drink. It was about like whether she was going to die, whether she was going to go back to that man, you know, and we will like work. And like, I would think like she got so much better. And then she would call me the other day and she'd be like, I went back and now I have three broken ribs. And like, you know, in the beginning, I would be like really, like I would get frustrated. And but then one day it just reached a point in my prayer. It's like, you know what? Like what happens to her really like has nothing to do with me. And it's all God's work for her. And like from that moment on, like I started learning how to love her without attaching to like anything that she does and her well-being. And like through that, I started seeing our relationship like really transform. I started feeling like more energy when I'm around her. I don't feel as easily depleted. And that like, I'm sure like a lot of people can relate to that. I think like Bill talks about it too. Like I am just so grateful for this program because like this love without demand, like any resemblance of love that I ever learned is through relationship with you guys in this program, whether it's with sponsees or sponsors. And then with like family members, romantic relationship, that's probably like, I don't know, 20 years down the road, maybe I'll get there. Um, but yes, yeah, just grateful to be here. Amen. That was good. Uh, so Brittany is next. And also if you can't find the raise your hand button, you can just message, Hey, would like to share or whatever. And I'll, and I'd be happy to call on you. So if you can't find the hand button, just message on the persist participant. So Brittany, um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. So Kate, like, I swear to God, you're like my spirit animal or something. Um, everything that you said, I just related to on 
such a deep level. Um, you know, appearance is something that I didn't even take into account. I mean, I'm only 50 days sober, so I'm kind of new at this. I've been in the program um, for maybe about 40 days at this point. So I'm just barely going through my first step. But I didn't even take into account like just how much physical appearance mattered to me and how much it affected my sobriety um, or my lack of sobriety. Um, you know, I'm a hair and makeup artist. I worked in Las Vegas for eight years and it was kind of one of those things where I just relied so heavily on my looks. And um, about three years ago, I got gastric sleeve surgery done and I lost 120 pounds. So I literally lost like half my body weight. And um, that's when I found that alcohol was my crutch because I couldn't use food as my crutch anymore. Um, I didn't have a coping mechanism to, because my stomach literally could only fit so much in it, like about three to five ounces. So, um, I found that it was easier for me to drink instead of eat. Um, so I took one addiction to the other, which is not healthy, but just like what you said about caring so much about what other people think about you, I didn't realize how much that played a role in the way I started drinking and the effect that alcohol had on me and um, the effect that it had on my relationships, especially with God, because I lost God um, completely in my life. And so, wow, like everything that you said was just like so stinking amazing. Thank you so much for your honesty. Um, and just, wow, that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Nicole Kelly is next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, for your share. And thank you, Kate, other Kate, for inviting me. <laughs> so I wanted to say um, I definitely connected with the mental health uh, portion of this stage. You know, I'm someone who's had been diagnosed with mental health disorders. And, you know, when I, you know, it's one thing, everyone gets angry, everyone gets upset. Um, but it's a different kind of angry and upset when uh, you have a mental health disorder in there. And when you get those cravings um, to want to drink, it's just, it, it, it comes from your, the, my essence. And it, it, I, I'm fighting two beasts, <laughs> being an alcoholic and also being a, a, a member of the mental health community. And so um, one thing I always try to pride myself on is that I'm going to be the most functioning I don't even want to lay down my life and define myself by what these mental health all these disorders mean. I want the help I need. I get help. I meet with a therapist and I get all the supports I need. But I don't want it to be a defining factor. No more than I want an alcoholic to be a defining factor of my life, my essence, my identity. Um, I want to be, I have aspirations for more. And it's just a part of me. Um, but the mental health, it's, it is a constant struggle. It's always wondering and doubting what's real and what's imagined. What is, what did I amp up and make and what am I taking out of proportion? So I'm literally stuck sometimes in indifference being not able to make a decision because I don't know how much of it is my mental health disorder or am I right in the way I'm seeing things. And um, it doesn't help. I've also had some eating disorders, uh, you know, still with my weight. Bulimia, uh, anorexia, those are not pretty. Right now, for the first time in my life, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not grateful for COVID, but COVID did lend to me some important habits. A, I get up and I exercise every day. I get up and go for a bike ride. And also, it was the beginning, I relapsed right before COVID, and I just imagined a world when I was strapping my house with bottles of liquor everywhere. And I didn't want that life. So I have 82 days clean. So thank God for that. And um, I just really, really appreciate your share. It was just another point. Like I've heard quite a few speakers speak, but I, I never heard anyone talk about mental health. And it's important. I know it's important. It doesn't make me any more or less an alcoholic, but it is an extra consideration that I need to have in my, in my treatment plan, you know? So I thank you all for letting me share. And um, 
Thanks again for inviting me, Kate. Thank you, Nicole. That was, uh, thank you so much for your honesty and, and openness there. Uh, Bryce, B-R-Y-C-E? Yep. Hi, I'm Bryce. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, wow. Thanks, Kate. I could relate to an awful lot of what you said, and I, and like, there, I felt recently, like, a lot of the same things, you know, whether it's relationships, uh, financial, um, and I, and I, I'm like in this program, I'm like all in on this program. And I, I hear from you that you are as well. And we're, you got the answer. It's the same thing all the time. And the heart and all it was like to you know I just it just like popped into my head like uh when we are when we are like selfish fearful like the there's just like this prescription um that we have that like most people don't it's like almost a superpower because we've got got this program that is the way to deal with stuff. Um, and the thing I heard that like under everything they were saying is that it's, we're stripping away, we're like shedding the layers, getting down to, to, to the bare essentials and turning to God in every situation, no matter what's going on, no matter how it looks, it's a lesson to us. What I said, the way I describe it for myself is everything is a yoga. Every relationship is teaching me something and I'm working it. Um, every situation, like I, I may perceive it one way or the other and that changes from, you know, minute to minute. It doesn't matter. It's still, it, I'm still working through it. It's working something in me and it's for a purpose. So I think any everyone on this call like we can all take heart and when when we do that things start to happen like amazing things start to happen and the whole it's just like a different world and like once for myself once i've got a taste of that i just want to keep i want to keep going there and i know it's i know it's there for me when i yeah just like I don't always know how it's going to happen, but I, I know that it is now. I know that there's an answer and um, I'm trying to turn the right direction at all times, just in practicing this. So just thank you for sharing your experience and being, I think you've been very brave in just like putting it all out there. And I, I admire that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your share. Uh, Liz. H has her hand raised. Liz. Yep. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Liz. Um, thank you very much, um, everybody. Kate, that was really, um, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to you say the same thing over and over again, the same thing that, um, you know, I, I hope to really be like having grained in my soul, this one simple truth that no matter what else I go after or, hope for or focus on or pay attention to, um, it, it's not going to give me what I want. Um, whether I'm connected to that truth or not, like with my five senses and my faculties, the truth of what I really, really want is more God. Like you said, closer to God over and over again. Um, and I've tried everything over and over again, like you, um, like you said, one second, I mean, just two minutes. Okay, sweetheart. Um, I've tried everything else. Um, and like you said, one thing you said there, there's no competition for me. Um, there's no, there's no one competing with me to be me. Uh, but the only thing that, uh, interferes with that truth, cause that's the truth. I believe that truth is my own thoughts and opinions. That's really the only thing that is, uh, attacking that truth on a daily basis. You know, it's my own mind. Um, 
and I like what you said, this is, you know, what is it about me that's attracted to that? That's something that uh, I could honestly probably use as a, as a mantra throughout the day, because I'm always blaming, oh, it's this person. It's, you know, why, why are you being that way? That is not good enough. That no law, you know, it doesn't meet my standards. My standards are now different. Um, but what is it about me that is attracted to that is, is really the truth. You know, it's, it's, and then, um, yes, the problem's attachment. But then there was the other thing you said, like, that, you know, when God, you said, it, whatever it is, it never shows up. It's like right on time. God's right on time, you know? And, um, and that builds your dependence on God, you know? And it just made me think that, like, in my life, I have held on to hopes of things coming through, you know? I Sure, of course, God is there with me as my co-pilot you know, as I'm pursuing the things that I want. Um, but that does build my dependence. And like, how do I get out? How do I get ahead of that? Right? How do I make the thing that I want God before these other things? And I recently had a situation, which I thought was devastating. I had to evacuate my home and have an exterminator come in and leave. And, and after four, six hours of like, grueling manual labor in this house, um, I was in the shower and I just, I, the thought occurred to me to say, thank you, God, for these, this pestilence, right? Um, and I said it and I, like, as soon as the thought occurred to me, I was like, that is ridiculous. Don't thank God for this. But I said it anyway, because it's like, I believe that that's what this, this thing is about. And I was like, thank you, God. And at that very moment, a tiny ring fell off of my finger and I heard it go down the drain. And I was like, are you kidding me? Okay, fine, God. Thank you for taking that little treasure from me as well, right? And it reminded me of this little story from a book about a monk who was traveling through like the French countryside through a blizzard. And, and he gets to the place that he's going and he's banging on the door outside for hours, this old man in, in the snow. And when they finally came to the door and they said, oh my God, are you okay? Like, I'm so sorry you were out here for so long. And he said, it, it brings me so much joy to know that God dumped this snow on me, you know? Like no matter what happens, I do believe that those are the exact and precise conditions that God wants for me to wake up to that reality that what I really need to do is, you know, a Francis, a St. Francis move is, is not, is turn everything outward, you know? Um, and I said that, and I said, thanks, you know, for these bed bugs in my house and thanks for losing my jewelry. And a week late, you know, two hours later, I'm, I'm, I can see that comment Neo wise and my daughter's in the back seat and she's losing her mind because there it is in the sky and like the most beautiful sunset I think I've ever seen in my life and a week in the mountains and all kinds of little miracles. And when I came home, the ring was in the bathtub, which makes no sense because her dad took a shower after me, you know, and I heard it go down the drain. And it's like, thank you God for everything. No matter what I think about it, everything's happening for me and really just trying to point me in that direction of love God, seek God, serve others, forget about all this other stuff because it's not, it's not, it's not really the goal here, you know? Um, and, and I really appreciate everything that you said. Thank you so much, Liz. We really appreciate it. Um, I saw Derek on here. Derek, how you doing, man? You look like you got banged up. I heard you got a little banged up, man. What's going on? Yeah, hi Sam. My name is Derek. I'm an alcoholic. Good to see everyone. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, great, great talk. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that um, kind of grabbed me was when you were talking about attachment. Uh, I had opportunity a few years ago to do some uh, belief inventory with, with somebody who took me through the steps and kind of looked at my attachments to a lot of my not just my ideas, but my beliefs, those self-defeating beliefs that I have about myself. And, uh, and I've done a lot of work around that, you know, and, and letting God kind of take me to a better place and, and realize that those things aren't serving me or anybody around me any good. But I had an experience over this last couple of weeks with um, kind of seeing how my attachments to my beliefs that are grounded in principle can be just as defeating. And uh, what I mean by that is I, I woke up a couple Sundays ago in the most blinding pain of my life. And, um, and I thought I just had some pulled muscles, you know, and my, my belief about 
you know, that I'm, I'm a hard worker and, and that I'm, I, you know, I, I need to make myself indispensable to my employer kept me from being fully honest with them. I just kind of tried to play it off like it was just some pulled muscles. And the truth was, it was the worst pain I've ever had in my entire life. Like the only reason I didn't give it a 10 out of 10 was because I was conscious. Um, but it was really, really bad. And, and I had, you know, some commitments that I'd made to, to try and be of service at the Fellowship of the Spirit Conference over the weekend. And, and I believed that I needed to show up for that because I said I would. And, and um, you know, thankfully, I had a doctor who didn't believe me and thought I was in much more pain than I actually was <laughs> and um, ordered a stat MRI on Friday and um, said, what I want you to do is text my personal cell as soon as you get out of the MRI machine. And I'm going to have a new neurosurgeon look at the uh, results. And uh, what happened was by the time I got home, he said, you need to pack a bag and go to the hospital because you're having emergency surgery tonight. And I was able to kind of surrender to those who know better than I do, to the doctor, to the surgeon, um, to the idea that I need to show up at Fox because I said I would. Uh, my wife was supposed to be the Al-Anon speaker, and she, I knew that she was going to have to kind of, you know, pull out of that deal. And, and I really, through that process, was all of a sudden completely and totally at ease with the entire process. And I knew that this was what needed to happen to get me out of the pain that I was in, because the pain that I was in was, it was just so unbearable. Um, and, and through that, you know, as I, as I came out of surgery, I, I kind of, I I think I came out at about midnight and I was kind of fully conscious by about 3 a.m. and there was no chance of getting any sleep in the hospital room. I got on Facebook and saw everybody's, you know, kind posts and, and text messages I'd received and just was overwhelmed with the, the knowing that, that I am loved and that God is taking care of all of us, but particularly in this case was taking care of me and my family and that the conference was going to come off without a hitch and everything was going to be fine. Uh, regardless of what I tell myself. So uh, I, it's just been an experience in looking at how my, my, my attachments to my beliefs that are even grounded in principle can keep me in a place that's stuck and self-defeating. So that's, it's been a good lesson for me this last week. That's all. Thanks. That was great, man. So good to hear from you. Um, what about Bruce or Gay? Well, let's see Gay there. We see, they come to our meet. They come to the meeting all the time. I hadn't heard from you guys yet. Bruce, Gay, one of you guys want to talk? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to unmute it. There you go. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Here's Bruce. <laughs> gay alcohol. Uh, thank you, Kate. Wow. Uh, you said a lot of great things. Uh, I like what you said initially. You were talking about adolescent dependencies. And uh, boy, do I relate to that. I, I still can fall prey into that thinking that that's the solution. You know, what worked when I was five works now today. And of course, you know, I, I realize that doesn't work, but I still fall, you know, to the thinking at times that it does work. And because uh, the truth is that I know... Um, you know, that my reliance has to be on God, not on another person, uh, not on something outside of me is going to fix me. And, um, you know, and I, but I don't always realize that, you know, because I, I'm certainly not perfect. And, uh, you know, you basically sh shared a lot of that. You shared of your you know, your trials and tribulations throughout your sobriety of, you know, dependencies on other things other than God. And, uh, you know, having to go through that and walk through that. And that's been my experience as well. You know, I have struggled for a long time, uh, you know, with my job defines me. And, you know, I've had to come to realize, you know, that job is gone, gone a long time ago. And uh, that's not who I am. That was never who I am. But, I, you know, I got a lot of prestige, a lot of power from that. And, um, you know, again, it's just, for me, it's, it's getting back to that God-centered place of trusting and relying on that, no matter what. No matter if it works a little bit of time on something else, like you talked about, like 
this is really working right now until it's not working, right? And for me, I have to, you know, basically be, you know, slapped in the face metaphorically before I, you know, kind of get that message. It doesn't come naturally. It's just sort of going through this process of, oh yeah, I, I have to surrender and accept what is and the role that God's assigned me to do. And the role that he's assigned me may not be the role I want, but it's the role I've been assigned. Often it's not, but it's the role that I've been assigned. And that, that's what gets me back to that God-centered place. And thank you so much for sharing, Kate. Thanks for calling on me, Sam. Hey, thank you, guys. Hey, so, uh, Kate, we got about five minutes left. And sometimes I like to pick on the people who uh, spoke at the meeting at the end of the meeting. Um, so we're talking about going all in with God and, you know, not having any of these dependencies. And I mean, that was kind of a hard road for me from what I understand and a hard road for a lot of people, you know, like, uh, because at that point it has to be something other than a made up mental crutch that helps you get through your day. It's gotta be like, are we really going in on this? Or, you know, it's, what does this really look like? And I mean, a lot of people have had certain experiences that they found kind of wanting. And, um, I know for me that I just had a lot of, uh, fouled up prejudices and stuff I brought into religion because I tried to have been like dunked, saved, sprinkled, had all these things happen to me. And it was always like, I'm a good beginner. You know, I'm a real good, you know, uh, what was that? I'm a good sprinter, not a long distance runner. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your journey with that? And then I want you to tell the electron story if you have a second. We only have five seconds or five minutes. So, you know, just do your best. And if it pisses anybody off because you go a little over, you know, this is okay. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah. But you know, the way that you said that really spoke to me because it's true. When I came, first came in, I was an atheist and I hated the idea of God and I hated AA and I thought you all were pretty stupid. Um, and I was not willing to believe. And on the other side of being properly first stepped, I was willing to believe because I was suffering from a hopeless condition. And it turns out, just like the book said, that willingness was all I needed because from there, you know, if I seek, 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 the consciousness of my belief is sure to come to me, right? If I'm willing to, to look deep down within, which of course, as we've been talking about, is the last place that I look because I look at the mall and in him and all these other places first. But when I and left with nothing to do but go deep down and in it and look for God, I will find God. And so um, those first few years of sobriety, I just relied completely on um, the steps and the fellowship and um, some service work. And those are great things to rely on. And, you know, I don't know how far anybody else will get with that, but it worked for me for a few years. And I was afraid to really pursue any kind of God because if I thought about it too much, I knew that it was just fake and that I would talk myself out of it and then I wouldn't be able to do AA anymore, right? So I tried to not think about it. I just did the prayers that you told me to do. I did all the stuff that I was saying and that was it, you know, don't seek outside of that because it's probably fake anyway and you don't want to find that out because then you'll drink again. That's what I thought. And then eventually I became open to really um, pursuing God in new ways and, and allowed God to take me in these other directions. And, and that is so critical today because I have this idea that um, what I see around me is real. Like this couch is real and like this book is real and, you know, my phone is real, but that the unseen world, the energy world is not as real. It's not as impactful. And it's quite the opposite. Like that's not even true. So I have had to learn how to actually rely and depend on things that I can't just immediately see. Um, because it's so much more effective and there's just no way to get from like where I was to where I am now. And I, I still have a long way to go, but I'm just saying like to get from there to here, there's no way to do that. Unless like you have said, Sam, like I have to truly have a relationship. Like I've got to have something that works here. Um, and, and so I was doing some, you know, reading of outside literature at, at one point and um, was doing some reading around like, um, like quantum physics and, so the interesting things that I learned about that, and I'm not saying like come in here and go get that book because it's not, there was years of step work, step, step, steps in between that. So I don't want to give a false impression there, but um, basically what I learned from this is that 
we think of again like i was saying like the material world is so real and the energy world is not and it's all the same thing right at the quantum level it's all the same it's all energy it doesn't matter if it like is a book in physical form or if it's my thoughts in my head that's the same energy at the quantum level and so electrons do this thing where they can disappear and reappear and it doesn't like work in the way that we think it should you so when scientists discovered this it was like this shocking thing they can disappear and reappear and so it became thought that like that was a predictable pattern you could predict where they were going to reappear but that's not true what was later discovered is what's called the observer effect which is that they will appear where you observe them so observation is what collapses something from its um you know energy wave form into a physical matter form if that makes sense like the electrons collapse into a physical form from their energy form when they are observed and, and so the most profound thing perhaps that i've ever come across is, is is doing this reading and recognizing that like okay so the electrons that make up the atoms that make up the molecules that make up the cells in my body that make up the tissues which are organized into organs and then organ systems you know um my beating heart is collapsed into physical form because it is being observed something is observing that and if that is not the best evidence of god that i've ever learned that, that i've ever like been able to feel all throughout my body something is observing me into existence like i am so loved that i am in physical form right now because i'm being observed so that that is the god that i get to serve you know that is the god that i get to know and so again i'll just say one more time that when i go to god and i'm like oh i'm so sorry that i doubted you like that's the power that i doubt something that observes our entire world into existence it's that big so i hope that satisfies you sam beautiful so beautiful and i think i saw i think i see uh it's just a great job it was it was so beautiful uh, I think I see Don uh, sitting there with Mary there, and I was going to see if maybe Don, you, Don, you want to pray us out tonight? You want to say, we'll, we'll uh, if everybody can kind of get quiet, we'll put the mute button, I'll mute my loud, obnoxious self, and maybe we'll let Don, Don, you can close us out with the Lord's Prayer. Is that cool? All right, you got to unmute. There you go. All right. Thank you, Kate, and everyone else who has shared. Moment of silence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever amen thank you and god bless that was awesome right to kate and say how awesome she was <laughs>